Well, welcome everyone to Open House 2020. I know it's a little bit different this year, but it's still going to be fantastic. And Tony and I are very excited to welcome you here to Government House. He's going to take over shortly because I'm going to be called away to other duties. Um, but given that he's the one who is managing all the tours here at Government House, I know that I couldn't leave you in safer hands. So I feel very confident about that. <laughs> it's um, a difficult year, but I hope that you'll have the joy of visiting this beautiful building from the safety and comfort of your own homes. Now, I know that when you look around Government House with Tony today, some of you will be particularly interested in the architecture, others will be particularly interested in the history, but what's particularly important to us is that you leave us with some understanding as well as to the program that we run here. This is a magnificent building. It's an asset for all Victorians, but the important thing is the work that's done on a daily basis. So my role, the governor's role, has four main components to it. The first is constitutional, looking after the constitutional aspect of the, the life of Victoria. My second major role is ceremonial. And this room really comes into its own, this magnificent ballroom, when we're hosting, for example, Australian Honours Investitures, which we do often, wonderful occasions where we get to recognise the most extraordinary contributions by outstanding Victorians. We also host many awards um, ceremonies here for seniors, for land care, multicultural, um, the Victorian Australian of the Year, the list goes on and on. Another major part of our work is international, in terms of international engagement for Victoria. And we host events here too. For example, the last very significant event here was for the President of the State of Israel, uh, where we had many hundreds of people in this ballroom to welcome him to Victoria and to talk about the common interests between Israel and Victoria. And then a very significant component of our work is the community role where we spend our time engaging with Victorians from right across the state. It doesn't all happen here in Government House, but certainly right here in this ballroom, we have many major receptions, sometimes to celebrate the major events for which we're so renowned in Victoria, sometimes to uh, welcome young students. Uh, we have events here that um, can sometimes cater to younger Victorians, older Victorians, those who live in the western part of, of the city, for example, or the eastern part, just to bring different people in. The north, the south. And the north and the south. We don't leave them out. Uh, the Red Cross, um, all the service clubs, lots of lo and lots of community organisations, for example, to celebrate centenaries and other big occasions. Now, that's just a little potted version of the role of the governor. What's important now is I leave you to the tour director and I hope that you have, and I'm sure that you will have, a wonderful tour with him. Okay, so uh, we're gonna meet the governor again in the uh, billiard room, which will be the last part of the tour. Um, she'll have a little bit more to say uh, to you, but for the moment, I just wanted to talk about different uh, parts of the state apartments. The state apartments consist of five main rooms, the ballroom, which we're into at the moment, uh, then the state drawing room, the state hall, the state dining room, and finally the billiards room. So looking at the ballroom here, it, is, it really is a magnificent room and one which I think it's fair to say really thrills visitors uh, to the house. Um, these magnificent um, chandeliers are all on um, winches, electric winches, and they come down to the ground they, we, once a year when we have to change the light bulbs or um, repair them or, or clean them. Um, it's a great sight. Um, at the far end of the room is the minstrels gallery where in the old days the, um, the, the orchestras used to play from. Still today we have um, music performed from there, but we have had, for instance, in the room itself, a rock concert for young kids some years ago, which was 
a great success. In fact, I learned a lot about the most uh, famous of the local rock bands that day. So over here on my left is the State Chair of Victoria. It's a very important piece of furniture in our history and every governor um, from the first uh, to the last, um, or first to the present, have, um, have used this chair. And particularly on uh, state ceremonial occasions or occasions for events here in the ballroom, this is where the governor sits. I sit in the chair over here on the right and the um, Premier or whoever is the senior politician who might be here or, or the senior person from a particular organisation sits in the chair on the, uh, on the left. Above the chair is um, an old royal motto which has been used for over 900 years. On histoire qui mal y pense, and those of you who studied Latin in the earlier days will know that means evil to he who thinks evil, which is another way of saying be positive in your life and that's something that the Governor and I try to impart to our community as much as uh, possible. On the right is a portrait of Queen Victoria, uh, who was only 19 years of age when she was um, crowned as the Queen of England. Um, and she had nine children with her beloved husband, Prince Albert, on the left, left hand side. Um, I'm going to show you something later in the journey about Queen Victoria um, and the use of uh, her initials V and R. Uh, but for the moment, if you look around the room, you'll see all the way around the whole perimeter of the room, the initials E and R up on the ceiling. And um, that stands for, of course, uh, Elizabeth Regina or Queen Elizabeth, our current uh, Queen. When the, um, the ballroom was constructed, there's an apocryphal story that word went back to Queen Victoria at Buckingham Palace that this room was uh, a larger ballroom than her own at Buckingham Palace. Apparently this caused some consternation to Her Majesty and she sent back a direction to say that it must be made smaller, but by the time that it uh, that message came back, there being no emails or mobiles or anything like that. Um, it was The architect said it was too late, we're finished, and as he put it, I'm building for posterity. And so it was. So a little bit about the history of the house. The house was uh, built over four years and opened in 1876. Um, the ceiling in this room really tells the story of the time. There is, the whole of the ceiling is um, painted with gold leaf. And gold, the finding of gold in Victoria had a very significant relationship with the building of this house. Ultimately, there were many, many more people living in Melbourne and in Victoria than had happened uh, than was the case before the, the gold rush uh, happened in the uh, mid 1850s. Um, as many of you would know, there was a great dispute, a big protest that took place at the Eureka Stockade when the miners were demonstrating and, and complaining about having to have a licence. The licence fee in those days was two pound uh, and it was valid for three months. So if you weren't, that was a lot of money and if you weren't finding gold, it was even a lot more money. Um, and many of the miners were finding it very difficult uh, to find the money to pay for the licence. And that's essentially what led to the protest at the Eureka Stockade. It was a pivotal moment in our political history and uh, sadly something like 22 or three of the miners were shot dead a number of troopers were also killed, but ultimately the government uh, policy prevailed and every miner had to pay for their licence. 
That meant that the government became very, very wealthy. And in the 1860s and 1870s, we had a lot of boom time architecture in Melbourne and Government House was the beneficiary of that policy. So a lot of the gold money which was held by the government was used to pay for and to build this amazing house. Around the room you'll see a number of portraits. Um, they are of what we call the modern line of governors, commencing with Sir Henry Wenicke in uh, 1984. Um, when we go into the billiard room later on today, the governor will say a little bit more about, uh, about the, uh, the modern governors. But when we came here, these portraits were spread throughout the house and we thought it would be a very nice honour for each of the governors to have their portraits uh, in this beautiful uh, room. The governor did speak uh, a little about the contemporary use of the room. Um, some of the events that we had here um, have concerned the big um, um, major events that happened in, uh, in uh, Victoria and in Melbourne, um, such as the Melbourne Cup uh, Eve reception, the Formula One motor car racing, um, the fashion festival. Um, we've, as I mentioned the rock concert that we had for young kids, we've tried to we try to have a lot of events here for um, young uh, school kids and uh, one of them was um, Circus Oz came to teach kids um, from many primary schools. And it was quite dramatic watching the trapeze artists setting up between these two uh, chandeliers. Luckily, no damage uh, was done. Another great day was the um, ballroom dancing day that we had here in this room. Uh, we haven't had many uh, balls. There was one for 2,500 people when the house opened, but we haven't had a ball here, but we have had ballroom dancing. We had a great day here for what we call Ida Hobbit Day, which was International Day Against Homophobia, um, etc. And uh, there were something like a thousand members of the gay community, if I can use that broad uh, description, who came into the house and many, many were quite emotional. It was saying that this was the first time, and it was true, that there'd been an official invitation to that community um, uh, to a government house in Australia. Um, the Governor and I work strongly to promote difference in our community and respect for difference, and that was an example uh, of that uh, policy. Um, it's not one where we say you have to be one thing or another, but rather that we respect uh, all of our Victorians. So there are many Indigenous events we've had in this room, multicultural events, um, and lots of different music performances and the like. Um, so normally the numbers in the room would be around about um, 800, 6 to 800, something like that, and up to a maximum of 1,000. Uh, so that's about all I'd like to say at the moment. Um, other than to make one final observation about the broom, which you'll notice over on this side, that along with the Victorian and Australian flags, we have the Indigenous flag and also the Torres Strait Islander flag. We're very proud that those two flags fly permanently at our front gate. Um, everybody sees them when they come in um, and it's only proper that that should be the case. Um, so uh, um, from here we're going to go out through the fountain court and then into the state drawing room. Okay so we're going to um, leave the ballroom now and come out here onto fountain court. The first thing you'll notice is this magnificent fountain that um, is operating here rather noisily a lip at the moment. But many of the people in the ballroom flood out here on when it's good weather onto this beautiful part of the of the house. There's a great view over to the city on this side. And of course the whole 
court is framed by these magnificent and very old Grandifloria magnolia trees. And in the right season, they create the most magnificent flowers that are so large and they're so powerful. This is a very popular place on uh, our open day when the gates are open to anyone in the Victorian community on Australia Day, 26th of January, every year. Our first year here, we had 21,000 people came through the gates. Uh, so that wasn't, wasn't a bad number um, and we were thrilled that that could happen. So we look forward to the same thing happening in January next year and we hope that the COVID challenge is all over by that time and permits us thus, thus permits us to come, the community to come back into Government House. From here we're going to go in now to the State Drawing Room. Just have to watch our head going in through the window opening. So this leads us into the State Drawing Room, uh, which is one of our beautiful spaces here. If you look at this magnificent ceiling, you'll see that its design is reflected in the design of the carpet below. On my side over here is this beautiful fireplace. There are two in the room and in the old days that was the only source of heat that there was. So they, of course they built the fires up very fiercely. And a little bit of trivia here is um, I like to always point out these screens which some people think are embroidery screens but actually were used by the ladies to protect themselves from the heat of the fire, lest it might melt their makeup. But I'm happy to say that the makeup's improved over the years. They don't need, need to use them any longer, um, but there's still a very nice little bit of uh, history here in the room. Above the fireplace is this amazing mirror in gold leaf, and up the top, just below the garland, you'll see the initials V and R, which stand for Victoria Regina or Queen Victoria, who was the monarch at the time the house uh, was built in 1876. There's some wonderful traditional paintings around the room and perhaps one that I might mention over here is um, Arthur Streeton's painting, Land of the Golden Fleece, which he painted in 1926, which is a beautiful rendition of the Grampians, a famous part of Victorian landscape. Now let me take you over to the conservatory. So we're in the beautiful conservatory with its view across the western lawn and onto the city of Melbourne. Um, it's a beautiful room, many people love coming in here. Um, and uh, you'll see here a photograph of the future King George V and, his, um, and, and Queen Mary, his wife, who came to visit Melbourne for the Federation celebrations in 1901 and they came to visit the house and had their photograph taken here in this room and you'll see behind them there's a lot of fernery and the like and so we've done our best to recreate that feeling with the uh, different vegetation that you see around the room. Let's go now to the State Hall, which is just over here on my left. As you can see, it's a pretty magnificent space, very, very tall with great volume. Um, and behind me is the State entrance with its beautiful tessellated tiled floor. And it's from there that most of the public come into the house. Okay, let's go over and say hello to the Queen. Um, she's This is 
a famous portrait in the house, and properly so, um, painted by Brian Dunlop in uh, 1984. It was to celebrate Victoria's 150th centenary, and um, I actually love the painting. I think it's captured the Queen's compassion and serenity. Opposite the Queen is one of our Indigenous works. This was a tapestry done by the Victorian Tapestry Workshop from um, a Western Australian work from a community uh, near Docker River. Um, I like this work very much as well. And we're very proud to be able to have the, Vict the Victorian and Australian flags standing in this place with the Indigenous flag and the Torres Strait Islander flag, um, which are permanently on display at the front gate. And also you saw them, those flags inside the ballroom before. I think also that the one person who'd be very pleased to be sitting opposite that work is the Queen herself. Over on our, on this side, is one of the contemporary works that's come into the house. This one by a great Victorian female artist, Sally Smart. So when the governor and I came to live in the house in 2015, um, we noted that all of the painting loaned, all of the paintings loaned by the NGV were of the traditional form by great Victorian artists. Um, but the governor spoke with Tony Elwood, the director of the gallery, and explained that as she was the governor for all of Victoria and all Victorians, um, if possible, we'd love to have some art by young male and female artists, by um, Indigenous artists. And these two works that I've just pointed out to you are the beneficiaries of uh, Tony Elwood's ready acceptance of that change of policy. From here we're going into the state dining room, which is over here on my right. Okay, we're now in the stunning state dining room, uh, which features this magnificent uh, 20 metre long Australian cedar table with a Spanish mahogany skirt made by James McEwen and Sons, who were colonial cabinet makers in the 1840s, 50s and 60s in Victoria. They were the forebears of McEwen's Hardware's store, uh, which some of you might remember from Bourke Street in Melbourne. I certainly do. Anyway, we've set a little bit of the table so that you can get an idea of what it looks like, but um, it's uh, best appreciated in all its grandeur if you go to our website where there's a time release video of the table being set. The video only takes about four minutes, but actually it takes about four hours, perhaps even a little more to set the table properly, but it looks pretty good. This table has seen a lot of history. It's had wonderful dinners for kings and queens, leaders of nations and government. Um, we've had a couple of state dinners since we've been here in 20, uh, since 2015. Uh, but we've also, consistent with the point I was making earlier about the house being a, a very important community asset, we've opened this room and this table up to many Victorians. You can learn more about the use of the table in that sense uh, by looking at the role of the governor video, which is also on our web website. It's in five separate chapters. Um, and. Um, takes all up about half an hour. Um, but I did want to take you across to one of the great works in the house, uh, this wonderful portrait of Dame Nellie Melba, painted by Rupert Bunny, one of our great artists from the late 1800s and early 1900s. When he painted this work in 1902, Dame Nellie Melba was the most famous operatic star in the world. I like to say she was more famous than Beyonce in her, in her day. Um, but 
She grew up um, near Lilydale, uh, where her father had a limestone quarry. She was a bit of a tomboy, used to ride the horses and swear like the boys and smoke cigarettes and the like. But she also could play the piano and sing and she used to come and entertain the governor and his wife of the time. And I understand that this is one of the grand pianos in the house that she played on. And one of the spouses said to her, you've got quite a good voice, you should, but you should train yourself up and you might go somewhere. Well, she did, as we know. And uh, she doesn't look much like a tomboy in this picture, I don't think. At the time that she came back to a tumultuous welcome in 1902, she was also said to be the wealthiest woman in Australia. And that was because she used to demand 50% of the box office every time she performed, and she was so good that she got it. Let's go now to the billiard room. Okay, this is the conclusion of the tour. I've come into the billiard room, and before we speak any further about any other part of it, I did want to point out one of the favourite selfie spots for visitors um, are the royal spades, as we like to call them. Um, when members of the royal family, who are ultimately going to become king or queen of England, visit the house, they're invited to plant a ceremonial tree. And so it was in 1983 that Prince Charles and Princess Diana used the shovel to plant the trees, the photographs of which are on either side of their shovel. And then in, um, actually I said shovel, I should call a spade a spade. Um, and on the right is Prince William's spade, which was used in 2010 to plant his tree. By far the most important aspect of the room, however, are these wonderful photographs of every governor and his spouse, um, including our governor again. Nice to see you again, governor. Well, it's always nice to see you. <laughs> this is really one of my favourite parts of not only this room, but the house, because right here we have collectively the whole history of the governors of Victoria. And it actually tells us a lot First of all, it tells us that it wasn't until 1974 when Governor Winnicky was appointed that we had a governor who was born in Victoria. Until then, all the governors had come from the United Kingdom. I think what's important is that since Governor Winnicky's appointment, a number of the governors have been born overseas or, like me, had one parent born overseas. And given that Victoria is such a diverse community, with almost half of us being born overseas or having one parent born overseas, as you know, it's really important that we reflect that diversity. So it's something I hope will continue more and more obviously. Um, it's something that is important to every single one of us as Victorians. The other thing that I really uh, like to point out to people when we look at this wall is that the governor's spouses are there and that's incredibly important because throughout history, they have contributed so very much to our state. And I suppose that brings me to say there's no exception right now. You have just um, met and hopefully enjoyed our chief tour guide around here. So thanks very much for doing that. And I think that's time probably for us to end the tour, is it? It is. It's been a delight to do it. Um, I do want to say thank you to all of those Victorians that, and others who might have joined us today. We are very sorry that we couldn't see uh, people in person, but uh, we can't do that until the current COVID challenge is over. It's true. Um, and then when that happens, we look forward to our community coming back into the house. We do. Moment. Technology is fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. And it enables us to, to share things in this way, but nothing will ever beat the face-to-face -face contact too that we all yearn for. So hopefully next year's Open Day will be conducted in that way. Yeah. Thank you though, all everyone, for joining us. Um, and I hope it's been an enjoyable tour for you. <laughs>